It was an interesting season for Ryan Mountcastle, a dominant first half followed by some numbers in the second half that didn't look great. But when you dive deeper into those numbers, was he better in 2022 than he was in 2021? We'll be joined by Paul Valley of the Bat Around to break all that down coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Friday, October 14th, 2022. And welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And we thank you so much for joining us here. Of course, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. We're going to be joined by Paul Valley here, the co-host of the Bat Around and also now co-host of Give That Fan a Podcast with Ryan Blake, who you heard on this pod earlier this week. We're going to talk about Ryan Mountcastle's 2022 season, but today's episode, it is brought to you by Bet Bet BetOnline has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. BetOnline, where the game starts. So let's jump right into it. Ryan Mountcastle, who definitely had an interesting 2022 season, but Paul, to welcome you in, you know, I think some people think this was a disappointing season, but I feel like as we go on in this episode, can we convince people that maybe this was not a disappointing season for Ryan Mountcastle? I think we can give it the old college try. Um, the, the eye test would tell you that Ryan Mountcastle didn't have a very good year, but if you look at his peripherals, you look at his baseball savant page, it looks like if you were just to go off of that, he had a better year than 2021. So Let's get into it and tell these people why Ryan Mountcastle should be bet on next year. Yeah, certainly. And just the kind of raw stats for Mountcastle this season, his age 25 year, second full year in the big leagues, 145 games was a career high, as was his 609 plate appearances. Now his home runs went down to 22 after 33 last season. He drove in 85 runs. Now his walk rate, 7.1%, a little up. Strikeout rate was a little bit down, which we'll talk about. But he hit 250 with a 305 on base, a 423 slugging, and a 106 WRC plus after a 111 WRC plus last year. He was worth 1.6 wins per fan graphs this year versus just 0.6 war on fan graphs last year. So the first thing I want to get to Paul is I think this is the most noticeable change in his production is the power. I think that's the one thing that definitely went down. You know, he goes from 33 to 22 homers. He goes from a 487 slug to a 423. So my first question to you, this is something I've been trying to figure out. How much do you put on Ryan Mountcastle and how much do you put on the new wall for those change in numbers? Well, that new wall robbed him of five home runs this year. So that still puts you only at 27. I think I remember a time or two where the uh, defensive, uh, where an outfielder robbed him of a home run in right field. Um, so he, he's probably close to 30. Um, that wall definitely had a huge impact. There were 51 balls hit this year that would have been home runs last year that weren't this year. So I think you can give a little bit of that to a, a little bit of his downward trend this year to that wall out there. And Look, this is kind of what we knew what was going to happen. You know, we knew that the right-handed hitter was going to be, we're going to be impacted by the wall for the Orioles, but the pitching was going to get better because of it. And that's why the Orioles are stockpiling left-handed bats to get on base uh, in their minor league system. And I'm I'm pretty sure that's why they're going to go after some left-handed free agents this offseason. Yeah, and, and I'm sure you noticed, but those looks that Trey Mancini would give after hitting a ball mm-hmm. to the wall in the first half, Mountcastle had a lot of those looks in the second half of the season, it felt like. Yeah, he 100% did a lot. A lot of guys, I think if they put the camera on them after either the ball being called just in front of the wall or going off the top of the wall, probably had those same looks. So I wanted to get into some of the more surface level stats that got better. And one thing was, hey, you know, his walk rate goes up 0.1%. He basically Mm -hmm. walks the same amount. His strikeout rate goes down about 2%. Is that the greatest increases in the world? No, but they both got better for a guy who struck out too much, I would say, in the minor leagues at times. And people were worried about swing and miss, especially on sliders down and away. It's kind of a kryptonite pitch for him. And for a guy who, you know, some were worried wouldn't walk enough. And that was one of the reasons why it took them a while to call him up in 2020 as well. So although they're small steps, that's kind of another tick for the point of he didn't really regress this season. Right. And if you look at 
uh, numbers across the league. Strikeouts are up across the league. And that's kind of, especially with launch angle, that's what you're going to get. You're going to get a bunch of strikeouts from a lot of players. And you, you can live with that if those players are also getting on base at a high clip. And that's where, like you said, Ryan Mountcastle struggles is that he doesn't get on base. He, he's pretty much an all or nothing type of guy, which we're used to here in Baltimore and we're trying to get away from that. But it is nice to see that when the other, when the league is kind of going up in strikeout percentage, Mountcastle's going down. And like you said, at the beginning of this, he's only, he only just finished his second full season. He's going to be 26 in February. So if those numbers continue to trend in that direction. I think people are going to like what they see from Ryan. Yeah, they, they certainly are. And, and listen, we'll get to, to, you know, all the, all the hard hit ball stats and, and everything he's done better, but I wanted to slip this in here because it's worth talking about this before the end of the podcast. He improved immensely defensively at first. Absolutely. Base. And you can see that in, you know, I think there's an argument to say his offensive season at the end of the day was a little worse this year than it was last year. I think that's perfectly fine. Mm-hmm. But when you're worth a whole nother win via fan, gra- fan graphs this year than you are last year in a little bit of a down offensive season, I mean, before even looking at defensive numbers, that shows you right there. He went from maybe a bottom 10 to a top 10 first baseman defensively. And that is huge for maybe not the most important position on the field, but it's still big. Yeah, the the Ryan Mountcastle, I think he was one of just eight or maybe nine. I think it was eight or nine um, players to play first base over a thousand innings in the American League this year. And of those players, he ranked first in defensive war, third in defensive run saved, and second in ultimate zone rating. Um, so he improved immensely at first base. There was a point where he was the leader in defensive run saved, and I legitimately thought that he might be a, a, a uh, finalist for the gold glove, but he kind of fell off a little bit there defensively at the end of the year, and that's just from playing more games than he's ever played, taking more bats he's ever taken, and, and kind of slowing down at the end, getting a little bit more tired. But the defense has been leaps and bounds better in 2022 than it was the previous two seasons. So kudos to Ryan Mountcastle for putting the time and the work in and showing the fruits of his labors. When you think back to him being drafted as a shortstop, which Jim Palmer never fails to mention when he makes a nice <laughs> play at first base, where do you kind of fall now? Because I think he's turned into, even if this isn't what he looks like every year, he's an above average first baseman defensively. That's what he's turned into. They have tried him at so many different positions. Are you at least, you know, feeling like, all right, I'm happy he found this spot. Are you still a little disappointed he never find a, found a more premier position in the big leagues? Or is it just kind of the bats here, he at least found one place he can help the team in the dirt? I'm not disappointed at all. I'm pleasantly surprised because, like you said, he got drafted as a shortstop, but the glove and the arm really weren't good enough to stay there. Then they moved him over to third base, and the arm wasn't good enough to stay there. They tried him at first base before moving him to the outfield uh, when he was the internationally um, the internationally MVP in 2019. And he showed glimpses at first base in 2019 of being uh, a, a, at least an average defender and glimpses of being a decent defender in the outfield. Uh, the fact that he's now taken over first base and his glove has gotten that much better, I am nothing but happy about what he's given the team defensively because there was talk coming into this year, where are you going to play him? Because he was so bad in left field last year, and you don't want to take a 25-year-old and make him a full-time DH at that age. Yeah, and at that athleticism too. I mean, yeah. you know, he's – again, some of these positions just didn't work out for him, but he's still athletic, and I think he's found finally a spot – where he can feel comfortable and show off his athleticism. Absolutely. Because there's guys who show off that athleticism. I think Anthony Rizzo is one of those guys who he's not the best defensive first baseman, but he likes to kind of show off that athleticism at first base. And Josh Naylor, another guy who comes to mind in Cleveland. And it feels like Ryan Mountcastle is able to do that as well, which certainly helps him. I'm just happy he found a spot on the field because then frees up DH a little bit more and, yep. and it makes you, you know, a, a little bit better when constructing a lineup, but we're going to dive in even deeper to some of these numbers that, that maybe show, you know, a different story about Ryan Mountcastle's season. But first got to tell you about betonline.net, which is your number one source for all your baseball betting this postseason. We're into the division series. we got some great matchups going on and all the odds, all the lines available at betonline.net, but it's not just baseball. Of course, we're right in the middle of football season, college football all day, every Saturday, the NFL all day, Every Sunday, got the Ravens in first place, finally getting a big division win and finally winning a home game for the first time in a while. You can find all the lines, all the odds, 
matchups, news, listen to podcasts, get in-depth articles and analysis on every game out there at betonline.net. So head over to the site. That's betonline.net. or Use your mobile device to learn more at BetOnline, where the game starts. So we're here with Paul Valley of the Bat Around talking about Ryan Mountcastle reviewing his 2022 season. And Paul, here's where we kind of get into the nitty gritty because you look at the surface stats for Ryan Mountcastle and you figure, you know, he wasn't terrible. All of his stats are a little bit down from 2021 and the power is maybe more than a little bit down. You know, going from 33 to 22 home runs. But all you do, even if you just like looking at colors, you pull up the Baseball Savant page and it's just red, 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 red. And red is good. Now, there's a lot of blue when it comes to chase rate and his strikeouts and his walks, which I think we've pretty much just accepted that's who Ryan Mountcastle is at this point. Mm-hmm. Average exit velo, 88th percentile. Barrel percentage, 94th percentile. Expected slugging, 96th percentile. Basically, what these numbers are telling you, was Ryan Mountcastle one of the unluckiest players in all of baseball this year? I think that you have to say that if you look at these numbers, uh, his expected batting average was 277 and he hit 250 this year. His expected slugging percentage was 509 and it was 423 for the season. Uh, He hit into some bad luck and, you know, maybe that's something where he's hitting a lot of really hard ground balls or he's getting hitting a lot of fly balls that just came short at the wall in right field or came short at the wall in left field. But this is a guy who was finding the barrel, finding the sweet spot a lot more this year than he was last year. And somehow they were turning into outs. And we kind of saw it with Trey Mancini too at the beginning of the year. And he kind of turned that around a little bit. Mount Castle was on fire in June and then July and August came. And it, it, it's amazing what his numbers were when you look at just how bad he was in at least by what the numbers say in July and August, I have to think a lot of that was some bad luck and we can maybe expect a turnaround next year. Yeah. And you mentioned those expected stats, the batting average and the slugging. He wasn't just near the top of the leaderboards in terms of like biggest difference between his expected batting average and actual batting average, which he was, he was actually at the top of the leaderboards just of expected batting average and expected slugging in general. Like Mm -hmm. if he had gotten normal luck, like any, average player would have gotten we would be looking at a season for Ryan Mountcastle where he numbers wise takes a step up from everything he did last year and maybe he doesn't hit 33 home runs again but everything else goes up and we just say oh he didn't hit 33 homers because of the wall but look at all these other stats and we're salivating over him you know hitting third behind Adley Rutschman in the lineup next year and he's probably still three four five hitter on opening day next year depending on who is added to this Oriole lineup, but it's, it's funny to just look at this page and you just, you can't look at these stats and not think about how unlucky he was. And one stat that is, you know, X Woba, which is kind of a, it's a very sabermetric stat. And it's, it's based on a lot of your exit velocities and your launch angle and how hard you're hitting the ball. And basically it tries to measure like overall performance and the numbers you can kind of compare to batting average a bit in terms of what is a good number his ex woba, so his expected woba last year was 326. That's when I think everybody agreed he had a, a pretty good year offensively. Mm-hmm. This year it was 362. And that number was in the top 7% of the league. 362, that's a pretty elite number. It went up that high when all of his stats went down. Basically, all is all of that to say is Ryan Mountcastle deserved a much, much better season this year. And it was also one of those things, Paul, that's interesting in it's not just you pull up the baseball savant page, you pull up the deeper numbers and you say, wow, he was getting unlucky. You would watch the games and you would watch his face as he rounded first after another line out to left center field. Mm -hmm. And just, it felt like even when his numbers were going down in the second half, he's smoking the ball and he's not getting rewarded for it. Well, and you have to wonder how much of that is a coaching staff for the opposition looking at video, looking at tape of Ryan Mountcastle and saying, where does he tend to hit the ball and positioning the defense in a spot where they can make these plays? But yeah, the, at the end of the day, it was just an unlucky season for Ryan Mountcastle. And really, when you look at it, he hit two home runs in April. He hit one home run in July, and he still finished the year with 22 home runs and 85 RBIs. And I know that those are kind of archaic stats, especially the RBI but he was still a productive player despite the bad luck, despite the two off months in July and August. And, you know, it's just, 
It'll be interesting to see what happens if the Orioles add a true number four hitter into the lineup and they maybe have that guy hitting fourth, Mountcastle hitting fifth, and Santander hitting sixth if Santander is still here to see what kind of pitches Mountcastle gets and what kind of damage he can do with a more elongated lineup. Yeah, you look at just these stats. I mean, he's hitting the ball harder than most players in Major League Baseball. Mm -hmm. He's just not getting rewarded. And and you did kind of transition into what I wanted to talk about because – you know, we expect the O's to add this offseason. Mm-hmm. And I'm hoping it's a big name infielder who can hit in the middle of the order, a Trey Turner or a Carlos Correa type. I know you're big on the Aaron Judge train. I can't get myself to expect that yet because I feel like I'm just setting myself up for disappointment. But I think we both agree they should add a big name to the middle of this order, which would probably take Ryan Mountcastle's spot in the order. But, you know, your perfect opening day lineup for the Orioles next year where now he's playing first base but where in the order does Ryan Mountcastle hit Uh, assuming that they add somebody and I think Jose Abreu would be the perfect player to add Um, I think to any of those shortstops if you add them they're not really four four hitters they're two hitters right Um, if you look at any of them but Ryan Mountcastle in my opinion should hit fifth at the highest he should hit fifth at the highest. And I look at him, I look at Anthony Santander, and they have the most power on the team. They, they're the guys that you that the last few years have been hitting three, four in your order. Those guys should be hitting five, six in your order. Um, at, with Mountcastle, ideally, Jose Abreu or the big bat that they bring in, fourth, Mountcastle fifth, Santander sixth. And I think that that elongates your lineup. I think it makes everybody else that much more productive. And then you have a guy like Kyle Stowers hitting seventh. I think that that makes your lineup that much better. I mean, can we even dream about like Trey Turner, Adley, Gunner, Jose Abreu, Santander, Ryan Mountcastle. That's your six hitter. I I, I feel very good about that lineup. I don't know if that's what the lineup's going to look like because I feel like Mm -hmm. if they're getting a Turner, they're probably not paying an Abreu. Or if they pay Abreu, they're probably not paying a Turner. But I I kind of agree. I think fifth is probably where he hits on opening day. And the other thing with the Orioles, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to remember, like, if you just look at the surface stats, I mean, especially early in the second half, right after the all-star break, I mean, no doubt about it, Mountcastle slumped and it even wasn't as much about the unluckiness right around there in July. I mean, he really wasn't hitting the bar ball as hard at times in July. And he, he did like slump a little bit, but he almost couldn't get out of that slump because even when he started hitting it hard again, he wasn't being rewarded for it. And right. the one thing to remember is the Orioles know this. Like the Orioles see all these numbers we're seeing and more, and they understand. Like I know there was a lot of discourse about, you know, is it time to, you know, trade away Ryan Mountcastle or look for another first baseman? Like, no, 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 no. Like the, let's shut that down right now. Like he mm-hmm. he's 25 years old. It's his second full big league season. You got all this control and he's got all these underlying stats that look great. But the Orioles see that as, you know, even better underlying stats probably mm-hmm that they have. And you look at the splits throughout the year, listen, his September and October were also great, which was really good because he had a great first half struggled and then finished really strong. And I think Mm -hmm. that was at least important for a guy who had all that bad luck and had those struggles to finish strong on a team that in general finished pretty weakly. And he was one guy who actually had a great September and October to finish the season. Yeah, the thing that people seem to forget about Ryan Mountcastle because the numbers looked so average this year is he has elite bat-to-ball skills. He has incredibly fast hands. He has a has an ability to find the barrel on inner third pitches unlike anybody I've seen in Baltimore in a good while. Uh, that's a guy who every year that he every down year that he had in the minor leagues, he would come back in the same league the next year and hit over 300. He's a quality hitter. I'm expecting him to kind of, and maybe this is a bit optimistic. I expect him to have kind of like an Austin Riley type of turnaround. Now he may never get on base at the same clip that Austin Riley does, but Mountcastle has every bit of the ability to hit 280 with 30 to 40 home runs in this league. If he can stop hitting into the bad luck. And one of the big things with him is if he can stop swinging himself into slumps, or elongating slumps because he's trying to get out of them so badly that he's swinging at everything in the world. His pitch selection, his swing decisions, if his swing decisions just get better and his pitch selection gets better, and I don't need them to be world beaters, but his whiff rate is 18% and his chase rate was in the, was in, in the 18th percentile, his chase rate was in the ninth percentile. If those can get up into the 30s, I think he becomes 
that elite hitter that we think he can be. Yeah, I'm almost at the point where I've accepted that Mountcastle will chase the 0-2 slider. Yeah. But if he can stop chasing the 0-0 slider, I think mm-hmm. that's going to change a lot of what kind of hitter he becomes. Because there's still going to be ways to get him out. I mean, he's never going to be Aaron Judge. So, right. you know, guys are going to still know how to attack him. But at the very least, you know, he can do damage on that first pitch and he can lay off and get himself ahead in the count. And that's what he struggled at times to do. But I think we're both in agreement, Paul, that this is first baseman of the future, Ryan Mountcastle. And even Mm -hmm. if he's not three hitter of the future for the Orioles, he's still productive player. So my last question, this is how I'm planning to kind of end all of these player reviews is say we're having this conversation one year from now where we're reviewing Ryan Mountcastle's 2023 season. What's like your very brief synopsis of the best case scenario, and then maybe the worst case scenario for Ryan Mountcastle next year? The best case scenario is that he gets back to that league average luck. Um, Best case scenario is he becomes that 270, 280 hitter. He gets back into the 30 home run arena. um, Doesn't have two months in a row where he combines to hit 199. Maybe if he has a couple bad months, it's 230 or 230 to 250. And then you look at his numbers at the end of the year and you're like, That's a guy who could hit fifth on any club in baseball. Now, the reverse of that is he feels so much pressure to put this season behind him and put up a good year and prove that he belongs that he just crashes and burns. And you see him go from being a 250 hitter to a 230 hitter. Um, The power is still there, but not in that low 20s again. I think that this year for him, honestly, was kind of a worst case scenario because of the bad luck and because of the down numbers. I fully expect a bounce back from him next year. And I think the next year is going to be more of a best case scenario for him. Yeah. We saw the bat come together as a rookie. We saw the defense come together last year. If they both Mm -hmm. come together in 2023, we're looking at a fairly valuable player for a first baseman. And I think that's really big to help this Orioles lineup, give it some depth and listen, righties are never really going to hit probably 40 plus home runs in this ballpark. Again, I think it's just something we have to be aware of unless they move the walls back in or or move it down again, which maybe could happen at some point. You never know Mm -hmm. what they're going to do with the ballpark again at this point. Um, But if he can get back to that 30 home run, he's still got solid opposite field power. I mean, he can hit the ball that way, get it out. He obviously has great power to dead center as well. And I just think you're right. You know, I could see him maybe taking some of this year into next year, you know, that chase rate becomes worse and he just kind of swings himself into the ground. But I think more likely the luck gets better and things look better for Ryan Mountcastle. And as we said before, I mean, if he's your five hitter or even if he's your six hitter, but even if he's your five hitter throughout next year and he's producing like we know we can, we have a pretty good Orioles lineup. And that was the thing that held them back at the end of the year was the Orioles lineup. And if he turns it around, Things are going to be good. I think this whole podcast was a good lesson in a bad month does not mean a player is bad. And also, if you just dig a little bit deeper, you can find that, you know, a guy is really still good. And sometimes baseball is a cruel, cruel game. And it 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 really was to, to Ryan Mountcastle this year. Yeah, Ryan Mountcastle, it, it, he can only get better. In my opinion, he's only going to get better if they find that that bat that they can put in front of him and stop having to have him be the, the four hitter. You get that, that middle of the order bat and Mountcastle is going to get that much better. And then you're going to be looking at him in a completely different light. So Paul, I know you got the bat around, you got the podcast with Ryan as well. Let us know uh, where everybody can find you and listen to you talk about the Orioles some more. All right. So you can find me at Paul Valley, the third on Twitter. That's uh, my name. I, I, I at the end of it, no Y on Valley. It's V A L L E. Um, you can find us on find, uh, give that fan a podcast. It's basically um, at give that fan a podcast. Um, on Twitter. And then you can find my show, the bat around every Saturday from 10 AM to noon. We usually actually go to about 1230. Uh, it's going to be me and Zach Goodman. Although Ryan is filling in for Zach this Saturday um, on the show. We're going to have Luke Jackson, who's the editor for press box on the show to do a baseball round table in the 11 o'clock hour. You can find us at uh, pressboxonline.com slash radio. You can find us at facebook.com slash press box sports uh, and on YouTube. And I forgive me. I don't have the YouTube off the top of my head. That's right all right. Now. Hopefully people are watching this on YouTube and it'll direct them right there. But uh, the Bat Around, great show. And uh, they have some great guests on that show from time to time. I will just plug that as well. But Paul, thank you so much for joining us. Obviously, uh, we're, we're putting some, some positive words on Ryan Mountcast as we head into 2023. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to do it, man. Anytime uh, you need me on here, I'm happy to do it.
So that was Paul Valley of the Bat Around, and that'll do it for this week here on the podcast. We'll be back on Monday continuing our player review series here on the pod. Until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.